two recent developments respecting the calling of an Article 5 convention. One, legislation was filed last July in Congress, which shows how applications for a convention are likely to be counted. And it's not what the convention pushers have been telling state legislators. The method of counting with the applications Congress is likely to use makes it imperative that the states probably rescind their existing applications. Two, a method of counting the applications Congress is likely to use makes it imperative that the states probably rescind their existing new constitution of which grants massive new powers to a new federal government. And I'll be telling you more about these two new developments later. James Madison trembled at the prospect of an Article V convention. Alexander Hamilton contemplated the convention with dread. And John Jay, who became our first Chief Justice, warned that a convention would run an extravagant risk. Altogether, four U.S. Supreme Court justices have warned against an Article V convention. Justice Arthur Goldberg, Chief Justice Warren Berger, Justice Scalia, and other legal scholars warned against it. Conservatives and liberals oppose an Article V convention. Convention. You'll notice that two of the Supreme Court justices I mentioned are conservatives, two were liberals. This war isn't between conservatives and liberals. Those who want to keep our Constitution and those who want to move us into the new world order. Even before the new government created by our Constitution in 1787 went into operation, the anti-federalists who hated the new Constitution started pushing for the before convention. This is why, during 1788, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison started warning against it. And Madison expressly warned that those who secretly wish for a new constitution would push for an Article V convention under the pretext of getting amendments. That's what's going on today. New constitutions are already prepared. The Constitution for the New States of America sets up a totalitarian dictatorship. We are disarmed under this Constitution. Here is the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America proposed by the Revolutionary Communist Party, USA. The Constitution 2020 movement is backed by George Soros. He wants a Marxist constitution. The National Constitution Center Progressive Constitution. Here is the Libertarian Constitution. And here is the so-called Conservative Constitution. Open borders are in the Libertarian Constitution. Abortion, sexual orientation, and sexual preference are expressly granted constitutional rights in the progressive constitution. Mark Meckler smears and ridicules those who warn that if Congress calls a convention, our existing constitution is likely to be replaced with a new one which imposes a tyranny. He sneers at those who warn that we could lose our right to keep and bear arms. 
but the so-called conservative constitution was co-authored by Robert P. George, who is a member of Mark Meckler's COS Legal Advisory Board. This grants new powers to a new federal government and imposes gun controls with red flag confiscations. At state legislative committee hearings, I've been telling legislators about Robert George's new constitution. Meckler would then tell the committee that Miss Martin wears a tinfoil hat. She is delusional and that neither he nor any of his alleged five and a half million followers have ever heard of these new constitutions. But at a Senate committee hearing in Wyoming a few weeks ago, Meckler finally acknowledged the existence of Robert George's new constitution, but said it has nothing to do with an Article V convention. It was just an academic exercise, and he, Meckler, didn't know a thing about it. Now let's look at the New World Order. You may remember that George Bush Sr. spoke of this. He didn't give details, just assurances that it would usher in a new era of peace and prosperity. Well, during 2005, his son, then President George Bush, met with the Prime Minister of Canada and the President of Mexico, and they hammered out a plan for the North American Union. A task force for the Council on Foreign Relations wrote up the plan, and here it is. This provides for the political integration of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. A parliament is to be set up over and above Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and our military and police forces are to be combined. This is altogether repugnant to our existing constitution. In order to institute the North American Union, they must get rid of this. To get rid of this, they need a new constitution for the United States. To get a new constitution, they need an Article V convention. This is what the elite want. They are funding the push for an Article V convention. Meckler claims that he's funded by the grassroots, by grandma sending him $5 checks out of their paltry monthly incomes with little notes attached saying they wish they could give more. But the tax form 990s filed for Meckler's organizations which he signs as president, show he's funded primarily by mega donors who each give his organizations up to $2 million a year. Moreover, two members of the Council on Foreign Relations, Robert P. George and C. Boyden Gray, have been on Meckler's COS legal advisory board since its inception in 2014. Meckler isn't truthful when he says that his is a grassroots organization. I believe that he is carrying the water for the Council on Foreign Relations. Now let's look at our Constitution and see what it says about a convention. Article 5 provides two methods of amending our Constitution. Congress proposes amendments or calls a convention to propose amendments if two-thirds of the state legislatures apply for it. The first method was used for our existing 27 amendments. Congress proposed them and sent them to the states for ratification. Under the second method, Congress calls a convention. We've never had a convention under Article 5. 
It is dangerous because it gives the enemies of our Constitution the opportunity to get rid of it and impose a new one. But the globalists have been pushing for a convention for 60 years, ever since the Ford Foundation produced the Constitution for the New States of America. In the past, conservatives defeated the periodic pushes for a convention. So Mark Meckler's organization, the deceptively named Convention of States Project, COS, repackaged a convention to appeal to conservatives. They claim the only way to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government is to amend our Constitution, and we can only get the amendments to do that at a convention. So let's look at the Constitution they say must be amended to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. With this Constitution, we created a federal government to which we delegated only a tiny handful of enumerated powers. We listed every power we granted to the national government. All our Constitution authorizes the national government to do over the country at large falls into four categories. One, military defense, international commerce and relations. Two, immigration and naturalization. Three, domestically establish a commercial system with uniform weights and measures, patents and copyrights, a money system based on gold and silver, bankruptcy laws, mail delivery and some road building, and four, with some of the amendments, secure certain civil rights. That's it. All other powers are reserved by the states or the people. I have a one-page chart which illustrates the federal structure of our government and lists the powers delegated to the national government. It's a short list. We are a nation only for the handful of purposes listed in the Constitution. It's only with respect to the enumerated powers that the national government has lawful authority over the country at large. If it's on the list, Congress may make laws about it. But if it's not on the list, Congress usurps power and acts unlawfully when it meddles. But this knowledge has been lost, and so the federal government turned into Frankenstein because we didn't know the enumerated powers and didn't care enough to learn, the federal government was able to usurp thousands of powers not on the list. State and local governments, educational institutions, hospitals, businesses, farmers, non-governmental organizations, and individual citizens collaborated with the usurpations by taking federal funds to participate in unconstitutional federal programs. Hospitals get their treatment orders from the federal government. They did this in order to keep their federal funding. To claim that these problems can be fixed by amending our Constitution makes as much sense as saying that since people violate the Ten Commandments, God should amend the Ten Commandments. But Meckler's so-called COS organization insists the problem is our Constitution. But obviously, the claim that we can control those who ignore the Constitution by amending the Constitution is absurd. Mark Levin pushes for a convention and claims we will get amendments to limit the federal government. But his so-called liberty amendments do the opposite of what he claims. His amendment to limit the federal bureaucracy legalizes what are now unconstitutional federal agencies, education, energy, health and human services, housing and urban development, agriculture, environmental protection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Our Constitution doesn't authorize those agencies. 
but Levin's amendment legalizes all such agencies for as long as Congress reauthorizes them. Article 1, Section 1 of our Constitution says only Congress may make laws. But since Woodrow Wilson, federal agencies have been writing rules, the Code of Federal Regulations. All these rules are unconstitutional as outside the scope of powers delegated and as in violation of Article 1, Section 1. But Levin's amendment to limit the federal bureaucracy legalizes these rules and the rulemaking process for as long as Congress approves them. Levin's amendment to limit federal spending is a knife in the gut of our Constitution. Our Constitution limits federal spending to the enumerated powers. If you go through the Constitution and highlight all the powers delegated to the President and to the Congress, you will get a complete list of the objects on which Congress is authorized to spend money. That's how our Constitution controls spending, but everyone ignores it. Levin's amendment substitutes a budget for the enumerated powers and thus legalizes the current practice where Congress spends money on whatever is put in the budget. His amendment thus changes the constitutional standard for spending from whether the object is an enumerated power and creates a completely new constitutional authority to spend on whatever Congress or the President want to spend on. It thus transforms the Constitution from one of enumerated powers only to one of unlimited powers. And while his amendment pretends to impose a limit on the amount of spending, that limit is fictitious because it can be waived whenever Congress votes to waive it. During September 2016, COS staged a three-day mock convention at Williamsburg, Virginia, supposedly to show that at a convention called by Congress under Article 5, the delegates would do nothing more than come up with wise amendments to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. COS invited Republican state legislators, and they proposed six amendments, all of which vastly increase the powers of the federal government. One amendment would delegate to the federal government powers such as I witnessed during the early and mid-1970s in communist Central and Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. It delegates to the federal government power over the movement or transportation of persons across state lines. This would provide constitutional authority for the federal government to do such things as require prior approval to cross state lines, require internal passports as in the Soviet Union, establish checkpoints at state borders, and ban the use of privately owned vehicles to cross state lines. None of their amendments limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. They do the opposite. They grant new powers and legalized powers the feds have already usurped. There is no amendment on the face of this earth which can make those who ignore the existing limits in the Constitution obey the Constitution. When the feds usurp powers not delegated, and when states and local governments and businesses and farmers and hospitals and educational institutions and individual citizens accept federal funds to participate in unconstitutional federal programs, all of them are ignoring the existing constitutional limits on federal powers. So their claim that we can get amendments to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government is absurd and false. They have another agenda. 
COS claims the convention method of getting amendments was added to Article 5 so that when the federal government violates the limits in the Constitution, we could rein them in by amending the Constitution. That's absurd. Our framers weren't silly men. They agreed that the purpose of amendments is to correct defects in the Constitution. George Mason's concern was that Congress might refuse consent to amendments which were needed to correct defects in the Constitution. So he wanted a convention added to Article 5 so that the people could propose amendments to correct defects in the Constitution if Congress refused to correct them. For example, our original Constitution had an oppressive defect. It institutionalized slavery. What if the states wanted an amendment to ban slavery, but Congress didn't agree? Well, adding the convention method to Article 5 permitted the people to propose amendments to correct defects Congress refused to correct. And our framers knew that our Declaration of Independence recognizes that a people have the self-evident right to throw off their government and set up a new one, and thus have the right to meet and draft a new constitution, whether the convention method were in Article 5 or not. So the convention method was added to Article 5 and it provided a second way to get amendments to fix defects in the Constitution, but it also provided a way to get a new Constitution under the pretext of getting amendments. COS claims that Congress has nothing to do with the convention except name the time and place of the initial meeting. COS tells state legislators that they will select and control the delegates to the convention and that delegates can't do anything but consider amendments requested by 34 state legislatures. COS's claims are false. Our Constitution shows at Article 5 that Congress calls the convention. At Article 1, Section 8, last clause, that Congress has the power to make the laws necessary and proper to carry out its power to call the convention. The April 2014 report of the Congressional Research Service shows that Congress recognizes that it has exclusive authority to organize the convention, including receiving, judging, and counting state applications, and determining the number and selection process for delegates. So Congress alone has constitutional authority to determine how delegates will be selected. And in Congress's preliminary preparations for a convention in the past, Congress has indicated that it would provide for the popular election of delegates. If Congress calls a convention today, we don't know what Congress will decide. They might again provide for the election of delegates, or Congress could select the delegates themselves. Who judges and counts the applications? Again, Congress has exclusive authority to decide how the applications are to be judged and counted. Is the application filed by New York in 1789 too old to be counted? Should applications filed in 1861 to avert the Civil War be counted? Are applications filed during 1901 for the popular election of U.S. Senators obsolete? One of the groups pushing for a convention has prepared a chart where they count all of these old applications with 
more recently passed applications asking for a balanced budget amendment, a term limits amendment, an amendment to rescind Citizens United, et cetera, et cetera, to get to 33 states having applications. Our Constitution shows that Congress decides how to count the applications, and the CONCON legislation filed last July in Congress gives us a good idea of how Congress will count the applications. For years, the convention pushers assured state legislatures that Congress can't call a convention until Congress gets applications asking for, until Congress gets 34 applications amendment. for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. But the delegates ignored this limitation, and they ignored similar instructions from the states, and they wrote our second Constitution. And in Federalist Paper Number 40, James Madison invoked that transcendent and precious right of a people to throw off one government and set up a new one as justification for ignoring their instructions and writing a new constitution. You can't stop that from happening again. If we have a convention now, George Washington, James Madison, Ben Franklin, and Alexander Hamilton won't be there. Who will be there? People who haven't been educated in civics and have never read this and don't care what it says, and persons of insidious views to steer delegates to the predetermined outcome, which is almost certainly a third constitution. A third constitution will have its own new mode of ratification. 
Our first constitution required the Continental Congress and all of the then 13 states to ratify amendments. But our second constitution, drafted at the Convention of 1787, provided at Article 7 that it would require only nine states for ratification. If we have another convention, nothing can stop delegates from proposing a third constitution with its own mode of ratification. The Constitution for the New States of America is ratified by a national referendum called by the President. Whoever controls the voting machines will determine the outcome. The states don't vote on it. They are dissolved and replaced by regional governments answerable to the new national government. COS says, there is no danger of getting a new constitution because delegates can be controlled by faithful delegate laws. But state legislatures have no authority to select the delegates, and Congress has already indicated that they will provide for the popular election of delegates. And whether Congress decides that delegates will be elected or Congress chooses another method of selecting delegates, no one has control over them because they can exercise that self-evident right recognized in our Declaration of Independence to throw off the governments we now have and write a new constitution which moves us into a new system of government. And since it will have its own new mode of ratification, it is certain to be approved. This is why James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, four U.S. Supreme Court justices, two conservatives and two liberals, and many other legal scholars warn against an Article V convention. And now federal spending. The Pew Report says for fiscal year 2020, 37.6% of the revenue the South Carolina state government got was from federal funds. And that's a pittance compared with the additional federal money sent into South Carolina to local governments, non-governmental organizations, research grants, price supports, subsidies, Medicare, Social Security, etc., etc., etc. We cannot properly rant and rave about how we need a balance, a federal balanced budget amendment to rein in federal spending when we have our hands out for all that federal money. And all that money and the money sent to the other 49 states year in and year out, decayed in and decayed out, is added to the national debt and all that spending is unconstitutional. I say let's enforce these and downsize the federal government to its enumerated powers. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Amendments don't control governments which ignore the Constitution. The First Amendment didn't stop them from banning Christian speech in the public square. The Second Amendment didn't stop them from restricting guns and ammo. The Fourth Amendment didn't stop them from spying on us without a warrant. The Fifth Amendment didn't stop them from uncompensated regulatory takings. And the Tenth Amendment didn't stop them from usurping thousands of other powers. So what's the solution? First, James Madison said our Constitution depends on the people having the virtue and intelligence to select men of virtue and wisdom to office. But we lost our virtue and intelligence. We replaced truth with whatever justifies what we want. We abandoned personal responsibility and we didn't learn the
limitations. Our Declaration of Independence colonial legislatures opposed the invasion of people and oppose violations of our Constitution. Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison said, since the states created the federal government, they are the final authority on whether their creature has violated the constitutional compact the states made with each other. And when the federal government usurps powers not delegated, each state has the natural right to nullify of their own authority all such acts of the federal government. The refusal to go along with unconstitutional acts is the remedy our framers advised when the federal government violates the Constitution. And remember, nullification is not a mere constitutional right. It does not arise out of the Constitution. To the contrary, it is that natural God-given right of self-defense which predates and pre-exists our Constitution. And stop taking federal money to participate in unconstitutional federal programs. It was those who had their hands out for federal funds who sold our reserve powers to the federal government. So what's the push for a convention really about? We know our Constitution already limits the federal government to the enumerated powers. We know our framers told the states to refuse to go along with unconstitutional acts of the federal government. We know everyone has ignored our Constitution for over a hundred years. We know that the proposed amendments increase the powers of the federal government. We know that amendments can't control governments which ignore the Constitution. We know that delegates can't be controlled. We know that a new Constitution can be imposed. We know that new Constitutions are already prepared. The globalists are spending tens of millions a year to get a convention. Why? Our Constitution is preventing the political integration of Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Globalists need a convention so they can complete their coup against us and get a new Constitution which transforms us from a sovereign nation to a member state of the North American Union. Read the CFR's task force report. This is what the elite want, but to get it, they have to get rid of this. And remember, any new constitution has its own new mode of ratification. If the mode is a national referendum, we are done for. This plus the mercy of God, is all that is standing between us and the hell of the new world order. We're on the edge of a cliff. Michael Ferris is walking the halls of Congress, drumming up support for Congress to call a convention. It is imperative that the South Carolina legislature rescind right away the application for a convention they passed last year and not pass any more. Learn the arguments and educate the legislators. They have been deceived by COS's false assurances and false claims. Legislators in other states are starting to listen to our warnings. In a South Dakota House committee, we defeated two applications for an Article V convention, nine to two. On the New Hampshire House floor, we defeated Meckler's application for an Article V convention by almost 40 votes. In Montana, 
We defeated Meckler's application in the Senate by a tie vote. In a Montana House committee, we defeated two other applications, 10 to 3. And when the sponsors filed a motion on the floor to blast them out of committee, we defeated them by 72 to 29. In Wyoming, Meckler's application passed the Senate by two votes, but we defeated it on the House floor 41 to 21. But unless we get rescissions in South Dakota, New Hampshire, and Wyoming, they will be counted by Congress's states which have applied for an Article V convention because they have non-rescinded applications on file with Congress. Our strength is that the truth is on our side, but our weakness is that there are too few workers in the vineyard. We need more people to learn the arguments, contact legislators, meet with them, and educate them. COS bots memorize COS talking points, wear their COS badges, and walk the halls of state legislative office buildings, visiting legislators' offices. They are doing what we better do ASAP if we want to stay out of the hell of the new world order. I always tell Americans, don't believe anything anybody tells you unless they prove you. I'm a former litigation attorney. I prove everything I say. I have an exhibit list which has links to all of my original source documents which prove everything I told you. Email me at publiushulda at gmail.com and I will send you the exhibit list. Thank you.